Everybody knows that if you don't know how to manage your money, your bank is going to skin you alive financially with overdraft fees and maintenance fees and credit card fees. That's obvious. But there's a hidden way that banks are keeping you poor that you really want to know about. A bank's job is to make money. Not for you, but for the bank. And the interesting thing about the banking system is that the less you understand about money, the more money a bank makes. Even Henry Ford said, I paraphrase, but enough people do not know about how the banking system and the monetary system works because if they did, then we would have a revolution by tomorrow morning. At their face value, the banking system looks very simple. You use a bank to keep your cash for your savings and your checkings account, and then you go back to the bank when you want to borrow money to buy a home or get a car. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Because if you really want to understand money and build your wealth, then you have to understand how the banking system works because if you don't, then you're going to be one of the people that's becoming poorer by the way the banking system works. Here's what happens. Banks let you open up a checkings account and a savings account for free. That way you take your hard earned cash and you deposit it in the bank. So anytime you get paid, your money goes directly to the bank. So here's what happens. You go to your job and you work hard and you make $100. Oh baby. Now, assuming you don't go cash out at Chipotle by buying some extra guac, you might take this $100 to your bank and then you are going to deposit this $100 into your checking account. So this is your bank and you just gave them $100. This money goes into your account and your bank is going to give you a receipt saying that you gave them $100. So this is a receipt. This says that you gave the bank $100, you have $100 in your checking account, and this receipt says that you can pull out this $100 whenever you want. But here's the thing, you gotta understand how banks make money, because banks make money by lending money out to other people. And where do you think that they get this money that they lend out? Well, it's from people like you that deposit this money in their checking account. And so when you deposit this $100 in your checking account, your bank is gonna say, ooh, I found me $100, what do I do with this? Hmm, how about we invest this money by lending it out to somebody else? So they find this person right here with a mustache and they're gonna loan them some money, but this money isn't actually the bank's money, it's your money. This was the money that you deposited in your checking account and they're lending it out to Bunty over here so he can go out and finance some mustache wax on his credit card. But this is where things get really interesting. Right? This is where you gotta really pay attention because you deposited $100 in the bank and then the bank is gonna turn around and give some of this money to Bunty over here so he can go and spend this money through a loan, in this case, a credit card. But the bank is not allowed by law to give out all $100 that you deposited because if the bank gave away all the money that they had, then if you went to the bank to withdraw your $100, the bank might say, oh, we don't have any money to give you. And if that happened, you would see mass panic, you would see chaos because people cannot access the money that they gave the bank. So in normal times, banks are required by law to keep 10% of their deposits in reserves. So if you deposit $100 in the bank, they are allowed to lend out $90, but they have to keep $10 in the bank. I say that's how it generally works because if you enter an economic crisis, then you can see this reserve requirement change. Like when the 2020 recession happened, the government changed this reserve requirement from 10% down to 0%. So banks didn't have to keep any reserves and they could lend out 100% of their money. Now that's very risky because if now banks don't have any money and people start to go withdrawing their cash, then this could lead to a credit crisis and that could cause a mass panic, which is why in general, banks are required to keep some money 10% of their cash deposits on reserve. So banks create a place for you to store your money, your checking account and your savings account. And when you deposit this money into your checkings account, the bank is gonna put aside 10% and then they're gonna lend out 90% because now that's how banks make money. So when banks lend this money out to Bunty, Bunty's gonna go out and buy himself some mustache wax and then he's gonna pay the bank back plus interest. But this is where things get even more interesting. So this bank, let's call this bank one. This bank, bank one, gave Bunty $90 through a loan that Bunty went out and he spent at this company. Now this company got $90 because Bunty spent this money at the company and what's this company gonna do with the money? They're gonna take their new money and they're gonna deposit it in bank two. So bank two gets this brand new $90 deposit because Bunty spent this money at a company and this company is gonna deposit it in bank two and now bank two says, ooh, we just got $90. And so bank two is gonna follow the same protocol here. They're gonna put aside 10%, which in this case is $9 and then they are gonna take the other 90%, the other $81, and they're gonna lend it out to somebody else. So you started off with $100 here. 
you gave it to bank one in a checkings account. Bank one put aside $10, and then they took this other $90, and they lent it out to Bunty over here. Bunty took this $90, and he spent it at a company. This company made $90, and then they took their newfound money, and they put it in bank two. Bank two makes $90, they put aside 10%, which is $9, and then they take 90%, $81, and they're gonna lend it out to Bunty's cousin over here, Mintu. Mintu also has a mustache, just like Bunty. You see where I'm going with this, right? Because now Mintu is gonna take this $81, and he's gonna spend it at a company, and then this company is gonna take this money, and they're gonna put it in bank three. Now this new bank three is gonna get this $81 deposit, they're gonna put aside 10%, and they're gonna lend out 90% of this $81. And so what happens is you start off with $100, you put it in bank one, and this bank one still owes you $100. I mean, you can still go to the bank and withdraw this $100, but this bank one is gonna essentially create new money, and they're gonna lend it out to Bunty. Now when Bunty gets this money, he's gonna spend it. This money ends up in bank number two, now bank number two gets to create more money from the money that you deposited. This money goes to somebody else, in this case Mintu. Mintu takes this money, puts it in bank number three because he spends this money, and now again, new money is created. And so it all started off with just a small $100 bill, but this money keeps getting replicated and replicated and replicated through the banking system because this is something called fractional reserve banking, and this is what allows banks to essentially print money because now you can go back and get your $100, but your $100 has already created so many more dollars through the banking system. So because of the system, banks are able to lend out money that they don't have because this $100 was yours. It's not the bank's money. This is your money. So banks are able to lend out money that they don't have based on the premise that you're not gonna go back and withdraw your money. Maybe you'll withdraw some money or maybe some people will withdraw their money, but everybody's not gonna go and withdraw their money or at least banks hope because if that happened, then this system wouldn't really work so well. But it's also backed by the Federal Reserve Bank because the Federal Reserve Bank is able to create money that they don't have as well. And so banks are able to lend out money that they don't have because they're assuming that you're not gonna go and withdraw your money. And even if you do, the Federal Reserve Bank can just create money that they never worked for. Because the Federal Reserve Bank is able to create money essentially out of thin air. Now, for those of you that are wondering how much money ends up getting created, it just becomes a mathematical equation because here you deposit $100, $90 gets created here, $81 gets created here, and on and on and on. And to figure out how much money is created, it's just a fraction. And if you want the actual equation, it's $100, how much money you invested, multiplied by one divided by your reserve rate here, 0.1. So it's $100 times 10, which is $1,000. You deposit $100 and $1,000 comes out. If you're not a math person, this equation is completely irrelevant, so you can just ignore that. What you gotta understand is that every time you deposit a dollar in the bank, $10 are gonna be created. What that means is as you deposit more money, banks are able to create more money. So banks have the power to create money out of thin air. So what you need to understand now is how you protect yourself because when more money is created, there's a cost that you end up paying. The most obvious cost is when you give this money, your money to the bank, your bank is gonna loan it out and they're gonna make somewhere between three and 20% interest depending on how they loan this money out. Whether it's the mortgage or a credit card or a line of credit, the bank is gonna get a whole bunch of interest and they're gonna pay you peanuts. Actually, they're gonna pay you less than peanuts because the interest rates that banks are paying out are essentially nothing. So you're making nothing while the bank is getting rich off of your money. Plus, depending on where you're banking, the bank might also charge you other fees like maintenance fees and overdraft fees. So you're gonna be paying a lot of money to the bank and the bank is gonna be getting rich off of your money while you get nothing. The second not so obvious cost is as more dollars are printed, the buying power of each dollar that you have and of each dollar that you keep in the bank goes down because as more dollar is created and enters circulation, the value of each dollar is less because now there's more dollars out there and this is what causes inflation and this is what causes the price of things to go up. So your rent gets more expensive, your groceries get more expensive, your vacations get more expensive, life gets more expensive, but your money is just sitting there doing nothing. So your money is flat while the cost of everything keeps getting more and more expensive. This is the hidden cost that you're paying because of this banking system because this fraction reserve banking system creates more 
and more money while the money that you have is not growing. So your money is sitting there still while the bank is getting rich, but now you are effectively becoming poorer because the money that you have doesn't stretch as far and the money that you earn doesn't go as far and the money that you're saving isn't as powerful. So the money that you have is becoming less and less valuable just because of the way the system works. That's why $100 today is not as valuable as $100 was back in 1970 because back in 1970, there weren't as many dollars in circulation so each dollar had more buying power. You would need like six or seven hundred dollars today to buy what a hundred dollars could back in 1970. You're the one that's working hard to earn this money and save this money but then your bank can turn around and just print this money out of thin air and every time they do that the money that you work so hard to earn and save becomes less and less valuable. The question now that you know this is how do you stop getting abused by this system so you don't become poorer because of the way the system works and you can use the system to your advantage. The first thing you gotta understand is how do you use the bank the right way? Because this does not mean that you shouldn't use a bank or that you shouldn't keep your money at a bank. It means you need to understand how to use your bank for your advantage. The first thing you gotta understand is how much money should you be keeping in the bank because you do need savings, okay? This is so, so, so important. Do not get this confused. You have to have savings. Now I understand, I just told you, your savings are losing value to inflation. I get that, but your savings, the purpose of your savings are not there for you to become wealthy. The purpose of your savings are there to protect you from a financial emergency because guess what? Life happens. Sometimes your window's gonna break. Sometimes your kid's leg is gonna break. So you gotta protect yourself. And the way you can do that financially is by having savings because when an emergency happens, you have cash that you can fall back on that we don't have to go into debt when an emergency happens. So you gotta have savings, okay? Now the question is, how much savings? If you are not a big saver, then three months. If you wanna be a big saver, 12 months. So three months to 12 months worth of expenses, you gotta find your sweet spot within that range. You don't wanna save more than 12 months worth of expenses, and you don't wanna save less than three months worth of expenses. Once you got the right amount of savings, you gotta stop saving money, and now you gotta use your money the right way, that way you don't become poorer because of the system. The second thing that you gotta understand is how debt works, because over here in the case of this example, anytime somebody borrowed money, it was for a liability. Bunty borrowed money for, I think it was mustache wax. This mustache wax is not making Bunty any money. It's a liability. He's paying interest to the bank to buy something that's losing him money. Same here. And so you do not want to do that because if you get into this game of using the bank's money to buy things that you don't need, that you can't afford, that don't pay you, then you are forever going to be broke because you're going to spend the rest of your life paying off things that you didn't even need in the first place. So the first thing you got to do is stop financing things that do not pay Pay you. I mean, if you really look at what debt is, debt is a way for you to borrow your future earnings and spend this money today. And so if you're spending $100 you don't have today, you're taking $100 from your future paycheck when you use debt. You're taking $100 from your future paycheck and you're spending this money today and now you get to pay this $100 back from your future paychecks plus interest. And so when you're using your future money, you are spending your future earnings today and you gotta pay this money back plus interest and this thing that you're buying isn't paying you any money. So you gotta stop doing that. A simple way to do that is just to follow the 24 hour rule. If you wanna buy something that you can't afford and you're trying to figure out if you need it or not, give yourself 24 hours, just think about it. Do you really need this thing that you wanna buy right now? Do you really need this mustache wax? Give yourself 24 hours to think about it because chances are after a day, you're gonna realize, hmm, I don't need this thing and then you're gonna stop the impulse buying. Third, if, keyword, if you are going to use debt, you should only use debt to buy something that is going to make you more money. This would be something like a business or real estate that's income producing because now you are using the bank's money to buy something that's going to pay you more money than you have to pay back. The thing you gotta understand here is anytime you take on more debt, you have to take on more risk. And so this is not something that you wanna do when you're just starting off as an investor. And this is not something you wanna do when you're just starting off as a business person. This is something that you can use as a tool to leverage what you're doing. But as you're doing that, you're gonna take on more risk. And you gotta be able to really understand that risk and how to mitigate that risk. And it takes some experience to get there. So if you are going to use the bank's money through debt, then make sure you're only using the bank's money to buy something that's going to pay you. But before you do that, make sure you understand the risk and understand what you're doing. And now finally, that you're not saving all of your money in the bank and you're not spending your money financing things that don't pay you, you're gonna have some extra cash and you gotta know how to spend this cash. Well, now you gotta use this cash to buy assets, investments, 
things that are going to pay you for owning them and things that are going to store their value. When you go out and you invest in a rental property, now not only do you own a physical tangible asset, a home, but you own something that's going to keep its value because a home is always going to have value. People are going to need a place to live and sleep. And if this home is in a great location, it's going to become more valuable over time because more people are going to want to live in your property because then it's in a great location. And on top of that, this home is paying you with income. Another way that you can invest your money is by investing your money in companies. There's a couple different ways that you can invest in companies. You can invest in companies that you know, like if your friend is starting this brand new guacamole business, you can invest in them, or you can invest in companies on the stock market. This is a much easier and a much more accessible way for people to invest their money in companies, because if you go out and you buy one share of the Amazon stock, then you become one of the owners, one of the shareholders of the Amazon company. Now, as Amazon makes more money, so do you, because their stock will become more valuable. So when you invest in companies, the whole idea is now you're using your money to buy value because you're buying shares, you're buying ownership in a company that's actually creating value because this company is creating products. And the goal for this company is to increase their revenue and create new products and provide more value to the world. And so if you own a piece of this company, while they're working hard to create more value and generate more money, then you get a piece of the pie because as they make more money, so do you. Both of these two things put you on the winning side of this equation because now as more money is created, where does this money go? Well, as people make more money and people have more money, they're going to go shopping and they're going to spend this money. So that means this money is going to go to companies. And if you're a shareholder of these companies, then you are one of the winning people because all the money is going to the company that you own. Or people are going to use this newly printed money to buy a home through a mortgage. And this is going to push home prices up or they're going to use this money to pay the rent, which is again going to come to you as the owner of the property. So if you own the physical real estate, you win because now people are going to be buying more homes, which should hopefully push home prices up, which benefits you. And if people are using this money to pay the rent, then you win as well. The whole idea here is I'm going to bring this back is you got to stop keeping all of your money dead here in the bank because when your money sits in the bank, it is dead. It doesn't do anything and you got to bring your money back to life by putting it to good use and you got to create the most value out of this money by using this money to help you make more money. That way you don't come out on the losing side of this transaction. When you're in your 20s, time is your friend. But if you don't use your time and your money the right way when you're in your 20s, then you can lose out on the opportunity to make tens of thousands, if not more than a million dollars over your lifetime. When you're in your 20s, you just graduated school. You probably just got your first real job. You're starting to make some money. You're trying to figure out how the real world works. You're trying to look cool. 